Hello and welcome to this episode of With Miska Podcast. And this episode, I'm going to be having two guests and they're going to be together. It's uh, Dan Pastevka and Evan James Bocchetto. So they are the filmmakers. Well, Dan is the producer and Evan is the director and one of the writers uh, of the wife, uh, the, our movie Couples of Wife Carrying. So that's the film that I acted and was shot a couple of years ago in America. And now it has been released here in uh, North America, which is the US and Canada. So this is a great conversation. We do it via Zoom uh, about... Um, how they made the film and how we made the film and also about their careers and uh, what about why did they want to do a film about wife carrying and this episode is going to be in english some of the sound quality is a little bit tricky because of the zoom but you can you should be able to hear everything but there's some issues with the sound but that's pretty much it the wife carrying can be found uh, just google it couples of wife carrying you can rent it if you want and if you're in finland You can re- rent uh, my horror film, Vihampidot, Insanity from Elizabeth. So that can be streamed too. As well as our film, Someone Somewhere. It's also in, has been released in Finland on Elizabeth. But now, enjoy my talk with Dan Pastevka and Evan James Bocchetto, the makers of Couples of Wife Caring. Hello, and welcome to our first Wife Carrying podcast. This is also with Miska podcast, and I have two guests here, and we are actually doing a live video, and uh, here we are on Facebook. Thank you for being here. We have, uh, hi, can you, Evan and Dan, what's going on? How are you? Great, so can you guys please introduce yourselves and, um, yeah. Absolutely. So my name is Dan Pistepka, and I'm one of the producers on the movie Couples of Boy Karen. And my name is Evan Bocchetto. I'm the director of the film Wife Caring or Couples of Wife Caring. Nice. Well, thank you for being here. And uh, my name is Miska Kajanas. I'm one of the actors in Wife Caring. Thank you for having us, Miska. And, and as we get started, I would just like to do a couple of shout outs. First, it's like Sunday the Academy Award. Awards. No. <laughs> uh, the first shout out is to Sunday River. Just want to thank you for your unflinching support of the movie. We're, we're grateful to be uh, collaborating with you, and we couldn't have done it without you. Lisa Linala at the LA Finnish Center. Thank you so much for Hello. allowing us to use some of your Finnish clothing in the movie. It really helped us represent the Finnish culture properly. Maria at Finlandia, thanks for tuning in. We appreciate it. And last of all, we would like to thank the World Wife Caring Championships in Finland for supporting us and uh, helping us on social media. We're, we're honored to be uh, collaborating with you. And it was very nice. Nice. I'd like to uh, you know, personally thank Yarko or Miska. And uh, I'm not sure if you see it, Miska, but there's someone in my background here. I don't know if he he's recognizable to you or not. Does does that does he does he look familiar? He looks familiar and it it looks great. It looks great. <laughs> Just without the without the facial hair. Well, yeah, thank and you. a little bit different uh, type of uh, hair color. And yeah. I would I would also like to thank uh, Salami and Tina because she she also gave us some finished clothes. Amazing. Yes, thank you so much. We appreciate your help. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure I have it at home right now. In storage, and I uh, can't wait to put it back. And everyone who's on uh, listening to this on Facebook on live, you can put comments, and I should be able to see the comments on Facebook too. So, if you have any comments, I'm actually going to test comments, and nothing happened. Yes, <laughs> now it is. So I can see if you have any comment. If you're saying any comments, yes. So uh, Evan, where are you? Uh, currently, I'm in my office here in uh, Philadelphia. Uh, I love the city of brotherly love, and I'm happy to be here. And How about I'm, Ben? Uh, I'm I'm in Maine right now. I'm at an airplane hangar, hanging out with uh, Yarko Carliani. Oh wait, sorry, that's that's not right. So I'm in Culver City right now. I'm in Los Angeles, and uh, just at the office, um, and. 
Yeah, excited to be here. Dan, I actually think it's pronounced Yarko Kardashian, if you remember <laughs> the joke from the movie. I, I already feel embarrassed myself for potentially mispronouncing that last name, even after <laughs> I made this movie. Having said that, I did my best. <laughs> no worries. I'm just happy that you're talking. Oh, That's thank it. you. Yes. Yeah, so you guys decided to do a movie about wife carrying. Why and when this happened, this well, idea? You know, we were watching the Shawshank Redemption one day, and we said, let's make something exactly like that movie. And so we decided. No, the, the truth of it is uh, Dan and I just got done with a film. You yeah. can see the poster right here. It's called Cassius Ali about the childhood of Muhammad Ali in, in Louisville in the 1950s. Yeah. And we had played at several film festivals and uh, we premiered by formal invitation at the 2015 Muhammad Ali Humanitarian Awards. Yeah. And we really got a standing ovation. Uh, it's currently an exhibit at the Muhammad Ali Childhood Home Museum in Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, visitors would go there and they would leave in tears and Dan and I said to ourselves, wow, you know, we, we really uh, made a great short documentary. We want to continue making films, but we need an idea, something that really resonates with our funny bone. Yeah. And we started searching uh, with another one of our friends, Brad Pula, and we all came to find wife caring. And we had a pitch meeting and we were just cracking up about this idea and we couldn't get it out of our head you know it's it's on the first hand it's it's outrageously funny and perfect for a satire and on the second hand we love that it's about couples because uh the endearment between two people who would train for over a year for this tournament is just it's really sweet and and we found that uh humbling and just you know we like romance and comedy no absolutely and I think from, from the producer perspective, you know, we, we actually started off with 10 ideas. So it wasn't just some kind of random shot in the dark. We decided to approach this methodically. And I remember we were down to our final ideas. And, um, you know, one of them was, was the sport of wife caring. And I think Evan had found something online and, and we were just blown away. It was just such an interesting subculture. We were, we were you know, watching YouTube videos. And I, I felt like I had heard of it, or I think they were, they were mentioning, you know, obviously Finland, they were mentioning some Scandinavian companies or countries, and they mentioned Estonia. And I have grandparents who are Estonian, so I remember talking to my family, and they had heard of this sport. And so all of it kind of clicked. Here was something that was funny. Here was something that was kind of part of, part of the heritage. Here was an opportunity to do something totally different than the last project something that people could resonate with. And um, it just felt right. And so, you know, it was, you know, that's kind of how it came to being. And we, we also thought to ourselves, you know, I guess also just from like a straight movie point of view, that this, I mean, it's just a real fun hook. So it had a lot of the elements and we just decided to run with it. And you know, let me just add to that real quick. Sorry, Miss Guy, I know you want to jump in, but uh, from a director's point of view, uh, you know, I always think about things visually and, and how can you really show visuals that have not been seen before? And no one's made a movie about wife caring, at least when we were writing the script. Mm -hmm. I know there was a, a similar type of movie that came out in India. And believe it or not, we've been getting a lot of press in India. So we're very happy about that. Very happy. But I mean, just the, the visual of a couple together running over. So sorry, can I interrupt? With you said that similar kind of movie came from India. Uh, yes, I believe it. It's a uh, a couple that uh, was forced into an arranged marriage. I'm not exactly sure. This is not. Yeah. Uh, don't, yeah. Don't, yeah. Don't, yeah. Don't, yeah. Don't, yeah. Not so much. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Rain of salt here, guys and gals. Uh, but anyway, it was a, a new couple to my understanding, and they said, well, how can we get to know each other? And how can we bond? And how can we find a commonality? And, and they they found wife caring. And, you know, it's, it's wonderful that you get to compete together and be athletic together. And you really have to trust each other 
in this sport. And I mean, it's just so beautiful. The relationships, the characters of these people, it's, it's yeah. wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. So actually your, I, I don't know if you mentioned, but I know it from beforehand that your process was like pretty interesting that you tried to come up with many different ideas, a topics for a movie, and then you chose one. What was yeah. that? So, you know, this, this is interesting and I don't know, I'm not sure where I, I don't know, personally, I came across it, um, but like that way of systematically coming up with ideas sort of resonates with my personality. It might be very different than something that Evan or, or Brad do, but I know, you know, I'll come up with just, you know, you sort of brainstorm, you know, a, a bunch of things and then you look at them. And part of what we had to do was not just find the best hook, but that was probably first and foremost, but also something that you could make at a reasonable budget and, um, you know, sort of given some of the creative constraints that we had as filmmakers. So I remember one of the ideas we had in the, you know, final three is there was this, it was like a horror movie with Scooby-Doo and, you know, it, it was just like, it was outrageous, but it was kind of funny. It made the final three cut, but we were just thinking about rights issues and we were thinking about just how difficult it would be and, you know, all of these reasons why that would never work, but it worked from a story point of view. And, um, so yeah, I, you know, whether that's a process that would be kind of repeated in, in the future, I'm not sure, but for this project, it worked really well. We each came up with our own ideas and then we just got feedback from each other. Oh, I like this. Here's why I don't like this. And it was kind of a democratic, um, sort of this, this process. And if all three of us liked it, then maybe we were onto something. So that was, that was, there was that consensus idea too. And to add to what Dan said, you know, he, he, he was talking about the budgetary constraints. Yeah. Uh, you know, two of my filmmaking idols are Robert Rodriguez, uh, who, as everyone knows, made El Mariachi for $7,000. Incredible. And also uh, Spike Lee. Mm -hmm. who I actually was fortunate enough to see in a Q&A while I was at university. And he was talking about how he made his first feature film over the course of a year for $70,000. And how sometimes you just have to put the money together, whatever you can scrape together from friends and family, and go in and make a project. Because no one's going to call you on the phone. No one's going to say, hey, I want you to make a movie. You've never made anything before. Come make our movie you have to go do it yourself and you have to believe in yourself. And these two filmmakers were very inspirational for myself, for Dan and, and everybody else in the project to actually say, Hey, we can make a terrific picture with no money, with, with no, you know, studio budget behind us and no marketing campaign behind us, you know, just with really warm hearted people, a great idea, and the belief and the courage that if, if you go forth and say, oh, we're going to make this thing, that you can actually do it. Absolutely. It, you know, an ability to learn, you know, an ability to, you know, stay determined. And then just to kind of persevere and see the thing through. I mean, Evan, you brought up um, Rodriguez. I mean, I think I go back to that constraints. You know, if, if, if ever there was any anyone who was able to make the most of, you know, terrible things happening on set and see those as good things or just, you know, seeing a limited budget as an asset, it's, it's him. And, um, you know, we, we had a crazy shoot schedule, which, which I'm sure, you know, Evan can talk a little bit more about. And it was, you know, pretty fun to, to schedule and budget there, but that is, you know, that dictated I think some of the, um, maybe a lot of the creative choices that, that we had to make. And, um, you know, there's something to be said about that, you know, to put boundaries or to put your project inside a sound box. So it's not just boundless. Yeah. Well, can you talk about the schedule since you brought it up? Oh boy. Um, yeah. So, I mean, the schedule. So again, just kind of speaking as a producer here, we, we had a certain, you know, budget in mind, you know, that was, I think that that was first and foremost. And, um, we wanted to obviously push that as, as, as much as we, as far as possible. 
And so part of the budget comes down to, you know, sort of, you know, you have your crew costs and then you just multiply that over the number of days. And we, we looked at it and we said that, well, you know, we would love to have, you know, months on set to make this movie, but it turned out we really only had seven days to do it. And that was a really harsh truth. It was something that, that kind of hurt to look at. And, um, you know, it, it, these were really tough conversations. And um, so we had to find a way to shoot an 80 page script in seven days um, with the crew that we had and, you know, not tear each other apart. <laughs> and, and, and we found a way to do it. So, you know, how, how that's done. I mean, it's just a lot of, it's, it's a lot of, it's a, it's a giant puzzle. You know, when, you know, when do you shoot, you know, is this scene done in the morning? Um, you know, what kind of lights can you bring? We shot in Maine, we shot in Maine, we shot on location, we shot at the Sunday river ski resort. Um, and so we had a lot of kind of natural things going for us. We had some crowds that could be working in our favor. We had, um, you know, partnerships that we were able to build with, with some of you know, basically the local community. Um, but you know, how you schedule everything is, is really, it's, it's a puzzle on every, on every project. And on this one, it's just, um, you know, it was, again, I'm just going to go and say constraints. So trying things out, understanding how long we're going to be there, looking at the money um, factor, and then determining what's, how can we create the best possible movie given the resources that we have? I have, a, I have a question for that. But before we go there, there's someone on chat, uh, Julia from Julia. Ir Ireland. Hey, Julia. Oh, Julia's been a... Uh, Yeah, she's been a she's been she's a big fan of or a fan of ours. I shouldn't say. I don't know if she's a big fan. But hi, Julia. Hi. So she's uh, she well, she's not asking, but she's looking forward to seeing the movie in Ireland. Yeah. When Maybe. is that going to happen? Do you have any info about Ireland? Uh, you know, I'll let uh, I'll let Evan touch on that one. But I will. I mean, maybe we can we can tease this. We have domestic distribution right now. Um, and what does domestic mean in this case? Right. So the movie is available basically on most cable, satellite, and telco providers. Um, and when then we're available on a ton of digital providers. So we have great reach on this film. Uh, we're going to be doing some theatrical screenings in Maine. Um, you know, we might expand and do some of that as well. Um, but that means that this is primarily the United States and Canada right now, maybe some small other regions. Um, in the North American continent, but the international would be everything outside of that. And we do want to do an international release and um, we'll say that we're working on it right now. I don't know if Evan has anything to add to that, but yeah. So now if someone wants to see it now, it's possible in uh, America, uh, in uh, USA and uh, Canada. You know, unless there's, yeah, I see, if, you, if there's a way to find it on Amazon, You know, in, in Ireland, maybe that's a, you know, there's something like that, but. There's uh, not. I actually have a friend in Italy um, and she was trying to watch it as well because she's a, a great fan of wife caring and she actually competed uh, in a European wife caring tournament and she found it exhilarating because she was, you know, as she put it, she was the jockey riding this great Bronco of a guy and she's guiding him around the racetrack and, you know, But she really wants to watch the movie. And I said, we're working on it. First, it's the United States and Canada. Uh, it's, it's fantastic that the World Wife Caring Championship in Finland has been promoting the movie because it shows interest. And yeah. Julia, thank you so much for, for commenting on uh, the feed. Keep commenting. Keep following us. You know, Just keep shouting out about the movie, and we will get there. Uh, it might not be today. It might not be tomorrow. But... Rest assured, we will get to the European release. Yes, so, and little addition to Dan is also, so if you type uh, couples of wife caring on, on internet, then there's going to be lots of options in America and Canada for uh, Amazon and many places where you can rent and stream it right now. Absolutely. So just put it on Google. And, but Dan, about the schedule, you said that how you prepared for the schedule and all that and yeah. how you, there's so many obstacles you need to overcome. So, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, Miska. Cause like, you know, I look on this poster 
that's your face right there. You were on set. You, you, you know, experienced the schedule firsthand. What was it like for you as one of the stars of the movie for an actor? You were on set. You saw how pressured it was and how important it was to be calm when we, when we got the comedic and the improv scenes and everything like that. Well, it's for an actor when you're not producing the film, it's so always so easy because you, you just tell us where, where we need to be and what time we need to be there. And then there's you guys who, who are actually carrying the heavy load. So we, we, we know what we need to wear, where we need to be and what time. And then you start filming. Well, I mean, let me ask you this, because on our busiest day and for people who, who don't know, there's probably a lot of uh, film lovers and, and uh, cinema lovers out there. But the normal shooting schedule in today's world is three pages a day for filming. Uh, on our normal day, we film 10 pages a day. And on our busiest day, which was race day, we filmed 16 pages in six and a half hours. <laughs> um, so Miska, I mean, usually I'm sure you have a lot more takes, you know, look at Alfred Hitchcock, he'd make you do a million takes. Uh, how many takes were you able to do? How are you able to to zen your creativity and your comedy and your improv into such a short amount of time? I think it was usually less than five, maybe two, two to four takes. Am I, am I re remembering it correctly? Oh, on the movie? Yeah, it could be. Well, some stuff was one take. Like I remember when you were doing your uh, morning exercise routine and nobody even knew this was coming, but we went into the, the room, the set, uh, that you woke up in next to your wife and you started exercising and you were in your underwear and you did a upside down handstand, which, you know, you can see in the movie in your underwear. Nobody knew it was going to come. We didn't expect it. Uh, we were totally surprised and we went with it because we trusted you as a as an artist. So how did you come up with this stuff? Were you, were you prepping while you were not filming? Talk to us. You were on location. Yeah. Well, well the uh, e easy thing for us was that we were there in a in Maine in that specific location for a week so we sort of lived through all the steps that what happened in the film so we had some done some preparing for the character and um, who we are and what's the story but when we actually got there there was so it was it was easy to improvise because everything that we we met the mayor for real for the first time we did the competition for real so I just interacted in these imaginary, imaginary circumstances, which were actually pretty real. So I just thought that, well, Jarko, the character that I'm playing, that when he wakes up, he would probably do something, uh, some kind of ritual or some kind of exercise. And I just started doing whatever came to my mind, thinking like he does think. So I, I didn't prep for that, but I had prepped for a couple of weeks or a few weeks by thinking like what kind of character he is. Yeah, I think you bring up a really, you know, I guess sort of the heart of this whole thing is that, I mean, this was, this was scripted, but it also was not scripted. And so just to, I'll, I'll quickly just wrap up. So like there was an incredible script and so you have to start with writers and, and Evan and Brad, you know, created an incredible story and then you have to line the script and then you put it into your schedule you you know separated by morning, day, time, evening, and then you know things might might change. But once you get on set for the type of movie that we were making here, I mean, and this is I mean what what Evan's talking about. Just there was such a there was a lot of how much you know there was so much improv, right? There was a script, but it was really elevated to a tremendous degree by you know the cast in this situation and that's such a testament to to you and to to joanna and to brad and to uh, to kendall so i mean well to add to that i mean the the script was 80 pages long yeah. um, and we we tried to put as much comedy into the script as possible but we, I think we left 15 pages blank in the script. So really it was only 65 pages of writing. Oh, good point. And we left room for the improv, for mm -hmm. 
people mm. filming real couples who are competing at the actual tournament. That's right. The film scenes with the actual mayor of New Remain and Caroline Achtera, who at the time was the president of Wife Caring. She is the mother of North American Wife Caring. She brought her over. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that was really the magic that as, as a director and Dan as a producer, we had the experience to know that, you know, from making documentaries that you don't know what you're going to get, but you just have to trust yourself that you're going to get something magical. And once you trust yourself and understand the process, it becomes a really beautiful feeling because it's one less thing you have to worry about. You know, we're doing 40 locations over seven days and we have no time for setups. It's all natural light except for one scene. We, we brought, I think, one one by one LED panel with us. Yeah. Um, and I mean, there's just so many challenges about filmmaking or making this movie, which include, you know, 30% of the film is, is in the Finnish language. Yeah. I don't speak Finnish. Dan doesn't speak Finnish. Our cinematographer doesn't speak Finnish. Neither does our editor. Uh, so we really had to trust Miska and Johanna to accurately portray the lines. I mean, we don't know what they were saying. We, I still don't know what they were saying. I hope they were being honest with us because they did the translations for the subtitles as well. Yeah. Um, but that's part of the fun of it. You, you meet new people, you collaborate together, and you, you build this beautiful uh, project and film and it's it's really a world on its own because people tell me oh at the beginning of the movie I didn't know who these characters were but at the end I was so into it and I wanted to know who was going to win and these characters just were larger than life yeah. and you know with the secret clips after the beginning of the credits they were just dying of laughter they were cracking up and they, they couldn't believe it. They, they just couldn't believe the world that was created uh, for zero dollars, a little more than zero dollars in no time with, you know, no connections and no nothing, no studio behind us. It's just a couple of, of very lovely people who went out to make a movie about couples and comedy and the sport of wife care. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I don't know if you've heard this story Miska, but you know, we, we did from the very get go, it was very important that we, you know, if we were going to tell a story about Finnish characters that our actors in here had to be Finnish and we were going to fly at least one person over from Finland. You know, we had done this, this casting session, but, and, you know, I actually, you know, I, I remember, we, I think, do we get a referral? How did we come across? But all I know is watching Miska and, and you know, just, just seeing that audition, it was kind of, it was a no brainer. Um, What's well, funnier than that, Dan, because if you recall, we did the uh, location scout. It was just me and Maine. And then you were scouring the planet, trying to find Finnish actors and actresses. I think this was maybe three weeks before we actually rolled on principal photography. Of course it was, because that's the kind of timeline we have. <laughs> so well, the Okay, yeah, no, sorry, continue. I mean, that, that goes to it also, Miska. Like, the, the time, between the time we decided we're going to do this and the actual tournament where we were going to shoot, what was that, Th two, three months? Well, or you, you know, it was tough because <laughs> Sunday River said, we flew out there for the location scout, and Sunday River was very optimistic about the picture. Uh, you know, we went over the story and, and kind of what we wanted to portray. Mm -hmm. And we knew as soon as they said yes, we were like, wow, we're going to be able to run in the real tournament. The actual president, the mother of North American wife carrying is going to agree to be in the picture, you know, but we don't have our finished actors yet. And it was one, the most terrifying experience in the world, knowing that we had a minor miracle with Sunday River coming on board uh, and also just terrifying and frightening that we didn't have our stars. We were trying to reach out to uh, the actor who plays Chewbacca in the new Star Wars saga because he's <laughs> from Finland, but he never, we couldn't get through. And when we found Miska and we, when we found uh, Johanna Antilla, who is another terrific Finnish actor, uh, it was just the most wonderful feeling you could possibly imagine. I think Dan and I went and we got 
you know, breakfast burritos at like midnight just to celebrate. We were just so happy. Nice. Yeah. Like, I have a specific question. I don't think it got answered yet. So where did you get the idea of wife caring? Who came up with it and from where? So, I mean, this was, this was Evan originally, as I recall, um, I don't, and he can talk about how he did it, but, you know, we each came up with our list of, you know, our, our 10 best ideas. We narrowed it down. Um, and I remember Evan presenting it to Brad and I, and us both, you know, I think we were all just like, maybe we spent a night thinking about it, or maybe we all agreed. I, I really, I can't. Remember. What I'm after is that who, when you came up with the idea, Evan, where did you get the idea the first time? Uh, well, I was, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we just got uh, finished with Cassius Ali, which mm -hmm. played at multiple film festivals and at the Ali Humanitarian Awards. And Dan and I knew we had to make a movie. So we were, we were scouring the internet, really, for ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, we decided we were going to have a pitch meeting. But even even though, you know, as Dan pointed out, perhaps uh, I brought the idea to the table, I want to emphasize that this entire project is a collaboration. It's it's not uh, to the benefit of, of one person. It's not because of one person. It's because of we all came together. And, you know, Dan, uh, for four years now, we've been working on this movie from the from the time we had the idea. And I mean, you can see Dan right there in the background. He's got the plane. He's so proud of this. You can see <laughs> Nispa, who's one of the stars in the movie, you know, podcasting this with the poster in the background. This this project's a collaboration. It belongs to all of us. It's a, it's a shared effort. I don't want to leave out Brad Kula, who plays Mississippi Al. I don't want to leave out Monty Bass, who's the editor. Stephanie Coates, who's the post-production coordinator and associate producer. Marisol Fernandez, associate producer. Jeremy Royce, cinematographer. We all did this together. There's many other people who worked with us. It's, it's and all, uh, uh, Well, I have another question from uh, the chat. Did we do the Estonia position and what, what is that? Oh, I'll let him talk about that. <laughs> So there, there's multiple positions which you can wife carry. Uh, there's a piggyback position, which is the normal piggyback. There's actually a great video on the Sunday River website, which they've been uh, so grateful in, in putting our trailer up and, and talking about the movie. But you can see Caroline Achtera of Sunday River uh, demonstrating the different positions. The Estonian position, is if you look on the poster right here, you can see Mississippi Al with Trina's legs. So she's upside down on his shoulders and her head is uh, right next to his, his buttocks. And uh, that's the Estonian position. It's, it's even funnier when you watch a, a lady carrying her husband and they go through the mud pit I, I just love uh, to see the guys go in the mud pit upside down. They, they blow out some snot in some mud bubbles. I think it's hysterical. Yeah. And what, I th what I find so funny about this too, and it's not even funny, but it just goes to show that, you know, this is a sport is, um, you know, they're looking for the best position to use, you know, what is, what is best for both competitors? I assume, you know, what is most aerodynamic? And, um, you know, this is, and this is just the way I've sort of formulated that this is, you know, the position that gets you the best time in these races. And pe so people have thought about this. They've experimented with this. I mean, it's so interesting. And uh, the main thing with the Estonian position is that uh, because the woman is upside down, she can put her hands around the guy's belly so she can hold on to the guy too. Right. So that's a good thing. And mm -hmm. there's another question from the chat. So uh, from Julia, our friend. So she's a champion mountain bike dog snorkeler. So she's asking, have you guys thought of doing, doing movies about the other novelty sports? Oh my God, we, we actually have thought about this. Um, 
Okay, I'm going to, I'm trying to remember. There's a list that we found, and I don't remember how early, but it was, you know, like that top five or top 10 weirdest sports. And number one on that list is the sport of wife carrying. And so that's, you know, you know, part of the novelty aspect. And, you know, Evan and I have had that conversation. We have sort of thought about it. Um, I wouldn't say in really serious terms, but we, we've kind of toyed with the idea. So I wonder, you know, what if we did, you know, a, um, you know, movies about, you know, number two, three, four, five. And I'm trying to remember some of these. They're, some of them are, you know, so off the beaten track that they're tough to remember. One was like maybe like cheese rolling, um, you know, little things like that. So I think it's interesting um, you know, I don't know if that would be the, the next project, but I mean, you know, this is, it's, it's, it's documentary. It's, it's, it's basically, you know, it's, it's a mockumentary doing movies, doing it, something else like that. I mean, I, I personally, I'd, I'd love to. So I don't, well, I don't know I have, things about that. I mean, well, I have another question. Um, well, Dan, Dan, you already started talking about this, but just really put it blankly, like, how yeah. do you make a feature film with no budget? Well, this is a question Evan and I have been dealing with. <laughs> so, you know, you know um, let's just start, you know, Evan, Evan wears, you know, like three different hats, right? He's, he's, he's director, he's, he's writing, and he's, you know, helping with producing here. And so we had to, you know, figure this out and you know we were talking to brad about it as well um but i guess my answer to that would be you have to pick so i mean if we're, if we're thinking and i almost don't like to think of it in non-creative terms because that's so important but the idea has to be conducive to the budget that you think you can get so we were very practical about this you know, we understood that it probably wouldn't be um, possible to have, you know, to be able to pay for a bunch of background actors. And so we had to find something where there would be tremendous production value, but we wouldn't have to put up that much money. So that was, that was kind of, let's say those were the constraints. And then we wanted something that was obviously very, very funny, something that you could do with a relatively small crew that you could shoot in a small number of days. Um, but then you also have locations that you have to, that you have to pay for. So if you did, you know, I think part of our top three idea, one of them was like an office comedy and that would have been nice. At least wearing the producer's hat, I said, Oh, I love it. One location. You know, you can have multiple actors. It would be a dream. You wouldn't have to change locations. You wouldn't waste time. You could be so efficient, so effective, you know, period. Um, you know, that, that could have worked, but I think, you know, this was just a better idea. Um, we did have to fly to this location, but we didn't really have to move. And um, we had the luxury um, of having a group that, you know, really just supported us. So being able to partner with Sunday river and they, they were so nice to us. Um, you know, they were able to help get us stuff um, at discounts or for free. And they introduced us to some of their friends. So we saved just a lot of money doing that. So, I mean, this was kind of a, I mean, it was a, it was a community effort. Everyone, you know, we felt like everyone was in it together and for that reason, and I'll also say this too, and this probably won't work on the next feature, but, because it was kind of a lot of maybe not not everyone's crew but it was certainly it was my first feature film and um you know evan's first feature film um because people loved this idea and we had close personal relationships you know people were willing to work at, at discounted rates as well so you could feel that that it wasn't about the money it was about doing something crazy it was about doing something fun there was that culture it was about going somewhere and um, doing something unique and novel and something that just you know is really quite big given you know how, how small the budget is so all of those things sort of contributed um and we where had did to you get up. the where did you get the money for this, this yeah money. so i mean i think we'd like to say that it's like it just fell in our lap 
but um, it was it was it was a it was a mix a mix of investor money, um, of personal money, um, and you know I guess some of the sort of like the you could say the the soft money that goes around with you know discounts and maybe um, you know back end deals. So, um, but we did have to convince people that um, you know friends and family that this was something that you know, could make them money in, in the long term. And we had to think about marketing in that equation too. So it's like, there's pre-production, there's production, but then there's distribution and marketing, which is, you know, has a dollar component as well. So you sort of have to be familiar with all parts of that process. And to add to that, I think everyone should, if you're thinking about making your first feature film for a very small amount of money, you definitely have to read the book, Rebel Without a Crew, by mm. Robert Rodriguez. Mm. I read it five times before we made this movie, and it's, it's a, a lifesaver. If you look at that plane behind Dan's head, uh, you know, people say, how could you possibly get an airplane in a movie when you have no money? I say it's simple. I went to the airport every day while I was on the location scout until I found someone who had a plane. I, I sat down with this gentleman who's in the movie, wonderful guy we talked for several hours about the sport about filmmaking and comedy and and really just life in general and i think at the end of the day we got an airplane which we you know flew in with the actors got shots from it's featured in the movie very prominently for about 50 bucks and you know this is what robert rodriguez says in el mariachi he has a zip line scene where they're zip lining from the third floor onto a bus and someone said, how could you possibly do that? He said, oh, I spent about $10 on the, on the cable and another $10 on the actual, you know, thing that you hold on to. And, you know, that was $20 out of the $7,000. That's a lot of money. Yeah. I, I agree with that. Uh, absolutely. Like, you don't have to throw thousands of dollars at these objects, these key featured items in your movie to produce a really uh, good visual environment. Yeah. It's about connecting with people and talking with people and, and sharing not only the story, but just share time with them. People are, are nice. People want to help. Everybody in the world loves movies. And if you're willing to, to be, you know, just a normal human being with them, you have no idea how much you can get done. We got 10,000 screaming fans, 10,000 extras for $0. And well, yeah. it's all about, you know, showing appreciation for who they are and sharing the experience with them. Like I said earlier, you know, if you don't know how to collaborate, you know, maybe this isn't the right industry for you because filmmaking yeah. is 100 percent a collaboration. And that is the most beautiful aspect of it out of all the aspects. Yeah. And I want to add just one thing. And I will say in this is, again, just coming in. Part of my job is, you know, we, we want to save money where we can, but it's, it's super important to just um, cast and crew safety. So if we're going to do anything where, you know, we're, we're doing any kind of stunt or, you know, we, we have to take into consideration. So as much as we want to, um, you know, sort of get that deal and, and get the most and get that production value, you know, still weighing that against any kind of risks and understanding, you know, you have to get the required insurance and you need this person on set. Um, so that, that is, that obviously factors into the entire production process as well. Um, but, you know, there, there's just certain things you can't compromise on. Um, and so we were very careful about that too. Well, I have another question from chat. Chat, um, was it difficult to redo scenes once the actors got wet? Hmm. That's a, that's, that's an Evan question. Uh, do you mean like wet in the mud pit or wet when Al is wrestling the alligator? Um, I mean, it, it, that's a very tough question and thank you for asking it. Uh, I mean, when, when the actual, because we ran this tournament or we, we filmed the, the movie in the actual North American wife carrying championships. It's, it's the real race. There's no faking it. These are not paid actors. Uh, I think we had maybe uh, eight minutes or nine minutes to film the championship race, which 
It's the real championship race. If you watch the movie, that's the real seesaw. That's the real beer giveaway. Your wife's weight in beer and five times for weight in cash. Everything is real. They welcomed us in the in the winner's circle of the tournament. And that's a that's a tremendous honor. But we had eight minutes to film the key scene of our movie. And I think we did it in two takes. Um, is it difficult? Absolutely. It, it's the most stressful thing in the world. You feel this knot in, in your stomach. Uh, you know, even one of our cameras, we had a, a malfunction in our card, the camera card, and we lost, you know, one out of four cameras of the main race, which is just devastating in post-production. But, you know, here, here's, here's what you want to do is just remember that it's about fun. This is a movie. There's, there's 10,000 10, fans there. So if you don't have an angle, and this is the beauty of the modern day age, and if you watch the movie and you're very uh, sharp about it, you'll see that not all the footage is from our cameras. I mean, we licensed footage from the spectators who were at the actual event. And people were like, well, how do you do that? And I learned how to do it from my uh, former boss on the movie 50 to 1, about the 2009 Kentucky Derby winner, Mind That Bird. And he, it's about the Kentucky Derby race, and he licensed um, NBC footage of the race and he interspliced it with the movie. Uh, the director's name is Jim Wilson. Uh, and so I learned from that. This is a, a very experienced man. And I, I found the footage online. I, don't, I didn't know how to license it per se, but I found the footage and I cut it into the movie from people's cell phones that they uploaded. And then I went to Dan He's the producing genius behind this picture. And I said, hey, Dan, look at all this awesome footage. Uh, can you go license it? Go figure that out. And, yeah. and that's, that's what I had to do. Let's figure out a way to do this and not get sued or you know, maybe you pay for it. And so that's, that's more part of the process. Absolutely. But it's affordable. These, yes. these are very affordable options. And I, I really hope everybody who's listening understands that. You don't have to have $10 million to make a movie. Though it could uh, help. Oh, yeah, it would help. It would help, but you don't have to have it. Absolutely not. And you, can, you could probably argue, too, that, you know, with, with that much money and, and no idea what you're doing, it, you'd create a, an inferior movie. Well, there's an interesting question from the chat that... Did we feel that uh, as though you were impeding the athletes that were out to win? Not at all. Um, that's a great know, question. And that's... So at, at the beginning of the tournament, um, the Caroline Ochtera, the Sunday River uh, president of Wife Caring and the representative for the tournament made the announcement uh, that there was a movie that was going to be filmed um, and we, we did everything in our power, everything uh, that we felt was necessary to provide a safe environment to the other competitors, to show respect uh, and honor to the sport of wife caring. Uh, we, we give a huge shout out and love to all of the couples that compete. It's just such a beautiful sport for romance and for love if you watch the movie, you can see a, a real life couple. They said they attended the sport five years in a row. And at the end of the previous tournament, uh, the gentleman proposed to his longtime girlfriend and she just, she was blushing and she had this grin on her face. It was just the most beautiful thing I've, I feel that we captured in the movie is that this is a sport for couples. It's about love. It's about romance. It's about finding an activity to bond together. And I mean, not to get into current events, but look at what's going on with COVID. Uh, I'm, I'm in downtown Center City, Philadelphia, and there's not much you can do, but something you can do, you know, if you're in a relationship, is you can grab your partner and, and go to a local park, you're outside, and get some exercise in, you know, get some wife carrying in. And I, I guarantee you, you'll be happy. It's, it's a really beautiful, beautiful activity. Well, that's great. Have you tried it yourself? 
Absolutely. I, I've tried it with several of my friends. One of the investors in the movie, a gentleman, he said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to invest in this movie unless you, unless you let me wife carry you. And I said, I'm fine with that. Let's go right now. You know, that means you get the investment. Uh, so I think he wife carried me for about five minutes and I was upside down my diaphragm. It's so much harder for the women than it is for the guys because they're upside down. They can't breathe. I, I couldn't breathe unless I was in the right position with my, my stomach. My, I'm, all the blood was rushing to my head. And I, I, I can't imagine how hard it must be with the stomach pain going on, the head pain going on. And then you go into a mud pit and you're underwater in the mud and you have you know, mud bubbles coming at you. I mean, it's hysterical to watch. But I really give credit to the, the participants of the sport, whether it be men or women who are on the shoulders, uh, jockeying the, the runner in the mud pit. Yeah. Well, one question that we want, well, one topic that we talked about beforehand that uh, is comedy still relevant today? Well, Evan left somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Well, so let, yeah, let me take a stab at that one. Yes. Uh, I would say going, I mean, we're talking about current affairs right now. Evan, people did you are, hear the question? Yes, sir, I did. Yeah. People are, uh, people are, they're sheltering at home. You know, there's, there's COVID in the air. And, um, you know, I think it's taking its, its toll on people. So I would say that maybe there's no better time than now to have a comedy out here. You know, I think, I know for me personally, I mean, I, I'm just dying to find an outlet. You know, I'm dying to sort of regain some of those experiences that, um, you know, that we were able to have sort of before all of this. And so I think, you know, whether it's this movie or just anything else that you're watching, yeah, I think, I think people want that outlet. They want to feel something. And um, you know, I think we did it with this movie, but I've, I've always been, you know, a fan of comedy. Always, I mean, I, I just, I just love it. And so, um, I would, I don't think I'd ever bet against it. I agree with Dan. I mean, you know, I have a, a lovely lady in my life at the moment, and and when we sit down to watch television or a movie. You know, we could turn on a horror movie or a drama, and it's just too serious for us at this at this moment in, in 2020. And we constantly find ourselves, you know, pulling up old comedies or or watching The Office, which is also a mockumentary like this film. So, mm -hmm. is it hard to make a comedy today? Sure. Uh, was it hard to make a comedy in the 90s? I I bet it was. I mean, there's something about Mary, you know, that comes around once in a decade. Um, but comedy is always there. People, people need to be reminded that they can laugh. They, they need to see the humor in situations. And honestly, it's, it's the ultimate, uh, device to bond people together. If you can sit, I, I wish we had movie theaters, but you can go to drive-in, but if you could sit in a movie theater, you have people from all different walks of life in the same room sitting next to each other laughing at at these wonderful experiences they're seeing on the screen yeah well that's interesting what you brought up um since the covid thing how has that affected the release of the film and how do you think it's going to affect the way people uh, are going to experience it well if there's anything that covid was is that it was unpredictable at least to a certain degree <laughs> so um we certainly didn't you know see it coming um then maybe if we had watched the the bill gates talk a little while ago which i had but you know i i guess in some ways you know we're, we're looking at this and you know the, the goal has always been to release this movie and you know there's there's some things you can control and there's some things you can't and um you know, when this happened, I guess, you know, Evan and I were trying to figure out, well, how might this affect the release? And, you know, on one hand, you know, we're thinking to ourselves like, oh, wait a second, well, maybe people aren't going out as much. So maybe that affects things. Um, you know, are people, 
you know, not going to be able to find out about the movie because they're not leaving their homes as much, you know? And so we went through that sort of that talk and then we thought to ourselves, wait a second, no, people are spending time at home. They want to laugh. They want to experience where we might be releasing at the perfect time. We're on all these, you know, cable, telco, you know, satellite providers. We're being released digitally. Anyone from their home, you know, at least right now in, in North America, can watch this movie and people have time to do that. So, you know, I think we, we'd love to be able to do a little bit more. I know Evan would love to do a little bit more on the road promotion and that's fair. And we're, you know, really focusing on digital, on digital efforts, but um, in terms of, you know, the audience and getting the word out there, this might be a really good thing for us. So that's what we're doing. How about you, Miska? What do you think about comedy as a, a rising star who is just, uh, you know, to be honest, a guest star in Modern Family opposite Ariel Winter? Boom, boom. Look at this. Yes. Full of plugs. He's just, uh, he's a plugger. <laughs> so what was the question? A plugger, but not a pegger. <laughs> That's just a joke. That's just a joke. It's probably funny. What do you think about? Uh, I do it, kid. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> what do you think about comedy today, Miska? You were just in Modern Family, and that's a, a tremendous comedy show in, in the nation. Well, comedy is important. Comedy is important because it uh, it helps us um, uh, experience things, and um, I, I'm actually missing an English word here. That's fine. Like if, if it uh, helps us to handle things that are happening to us and happening in the world. Yeah. So I think that the worse the world goes, the more we actually need comedy. So I think comedy will always be there. And that's really a way for us to cope in the fa when we are facing adverse adversity and uh, difficult things. Yeah. So I think comedy is needed more than enough, a lot, a lot, like more than ever before. It's a little bit tricky now because there's not that much live shows but we all can create comedy online and uh, comedy will find a way, but it's more important than ever, I feel. Yeah. Actually, uh, there's a question in chat to me. So Miska, American humor and Finnish humor is very different. How did you approach the gap? Hmm. Well, that's, that's good a very because, good question. That's yeah, a very good question. Because uh, Evan and Brad or whatever your team was, you had written the script before meeting me, so you, you had written all these Finnish characters. And um, I felt that um, that was written in a certain American voice. But uh, Evan, your whole team was really open for me and jo Johanna to bring the Finnish side into the characters. So I felt that we were giving like a framework and what we were expected is to bring the authentic Finnish side. And that's the way I think I was able to bring some Finnish humor to the characters too. So I think uh, the scripting created like one half and we brought the other half, especially with them, that we are real Finnish people. Which I have a question for Dan and Evan. Uh, wh why was it important to cast Finnish leads for the cultural representation for you guys? Yeah, I mean, we wanted, we just wanted to be representative and authentic to the sport. We know that the, the sport originated in Finland. And if we were going to make a movie about this, then why wouldn't we? You know, if it was possible, we were going to do it. it. It helps the product. It does, you know, it does service to the, to the sport. Um, you know, it makes us feel good about our, um, our choices. I mean, it, it, there's only pluses involved in, in doing that. So it's kind of an I over. With, I, I agree with Dan. I mean, listen, as Miska said, we wrote the script before we met him and, and Johanna and Tilla, uh, who plays his wife in the movie. But from the start, Dan and I really wanted, and Brad, we, the three of us really wanted to represent Finnish culture in an authentic way. We knew how important it was. Uh, you know, we're very savvy individuals and we didn't want to fake something that couldn't be faked. We mm -hmm. wanted to have the Finnish culture. We wanted to have Finnish colors and flags. This is America versus Finland. This is a Finnish sport. 
Yeah. Um, and we just knew that the the juxtaposition of you know an authentic American couple versus an authentic Finnish couple could lead to more comedic situations. Um, and and I mean I, I I really can't thank Miska and Johanna enough because you know before the movie. Uh, before filming, I had never uh, traveled to Finland. After we filmed, I, I traveled to, to Helsinki, and we even had a screening of the film in Turku, which Johanna and Tilla was so kind to help set up, and, and she hosted me at her lake house, so I got to do the whole sauna and then jump in the lake experience, which was wonderful. But, I mean, when I watch the movie and, and when people watch the movie, including my, my father and my mother, the things they say to me is just, how did you find these, you know, Finnish actors? They're just so authentic and hysterical and the accent is right. The humor is right. Just everything about them feels authentic. And especially in today's day and age, if, if, if you don't authentically represent cultures, you know, you're, you're in big trouble. You, you just are, you, you, it's very important to give respect where respect is due. Mm -hmm. And the Finnish country invented the sport. They're proud of the sport. We wanted to have Finnish actors representing the sport. And mm -hmm. I'm so thankful to have found Miska, to have found Johanna, because they delivered 110%. They were on time every day on set. They brought new ideas, which Dan and I and Brad had never heard of. And since the, the first day we met them, we just asked, what's Finnish culture like? How do people in Finland think about music? How do people in Finland think about the colors of the clothes they wear and their hair and the sport of wife caring? And as the director, I, I learned so much from these authentic actors than I would have ever learned from even a million hours or 10,000 hours, as they say, which makes you an expert uh, of research. You, you have to have authenticity. That's why we, we have authentic Finnish actors, authentic Finnish music, colors, and the authentic North American wife caring tournament. Nothing in this movie is fake. We don't have a fake airplane. We don't have a fake tournament. We do have some fake news. Watch well, out for the fake news, because that's part of the comedy. We should talk about that. That's it's so interesting because I mean, as Evan's saying, you know, we, we went above. I mean, we we wanted everything to be authentic, and yet at the same time, we knew we were making, a, you know, this satirical comedy. So you know, there's an interesting question about how do you create heightened comedy in a way that is still authentic, and that's and I guess I don't know. My take on that is that you know, good comedy comes out of you know, heightened authenticity. And so, you know, it's, we were towing this interesting line, making this entire thing because it is satirical and some of it's a little slapstick. And yet at the same time, we had to make sure that if this was going to be believable, that we were staying true to, you know, those elements that were actually true. And, um, and then, yeah, then there's the whole, you know, satirical fake news element, which adds another layer. Um, but that just, you know, made it even more fun. So. Well, I have another question for me on the chat. Look at this. Yes. Do you think having a Finnish accent, do you fear being stereotyped into a rally, dr rally driver type of a character? Is serious dramatic roles other than villains are available to you in the US? Um, I, I'm not fearing that uh, that that's that's going to happen because that's probably going to happen because I just know that I have a foreign accent at least for now and for definitely for some years it's going to take a while if it's ever going to go away so I I can only play foreign characters right now and I have sort of accepted it and um, I don't really mind being stereotyped into any kind of characters I'm just happy to be acting. So I have totally accepted what I sound like now, but I'm curious how, how American I'm able to sound like when I actually start um, interacting yeah. with more people now. Now I haven't sp spoken with anyone really. Sorry. 
Christian Christian Bale, you know, is a foreign actor. Chris Hemsworth is a foreign actor. They they can put on American accents for certain roles. They keep their original accents for other roles. Um, so, but Miska is just one of the most versatile actors uh, I've ever met. He he was so terrific throughout the picture, and you know his comedy is just spot on. And while we're talking about terrific actors, we haven't talked about her much in, in this podcast. I just sorry, sorry to... before you go to her, can I just finish? I want to add something to that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, but I can, <clears throat> I can do like other accents. I can sound Russian or German. So that helps. But I still, at this day, I cannot sound English or Australian, but I can sound, other, sound like other foreigners. So foreign actors is, characters is what I can do for now. Sorry, you were talking about great actors. I just wanted to, to say a thank you to Kendall Chapel. We've been talking so much about Brad and Miska and Johanna. Uh, Kendall Chapel hasn't been mentioned much. He plays Trina Thorne, Mississippi Al's wife, in the movie. And at first, she was a little hesitant about going through a mud pit upside down on Brad's shoulders. Uh, but throughout the filmmaking, she she really uh, found a, a comfort in the in the humor and in the sport, and she was just terrific. Well, she gives an incredible performance, and I think it speaks for itself. How did you find her? Um, well, we we did some some LA casting sessions, so found a LA casting is a website where actors can submit themselves to auditions. Yeah, I think we did, you know, when I said LA casting, I think, you know, like we did casting. Oh, sorry. But yeah. I think we also used LA casting and I think some other casting websites um, and then just found a room and I, we, she submitted. And she was, she was great. So she's one of the leads, basically the American female lead. Uh-huh. How, how many people applied to that part? 10,000 people. Fake news. 10,000 people auditioned. No, it, it was it was a very, uh, you know, you inside of 100 people auditioned. Yeah. Uh, but what we really were looking for Ooh. at the end of the day was someone who was, one, accepting of comedy, and two, had a lovely dip, dis, uh, dis, disposition. We yeah. wanted people with kind hearts to work with us, including yourself and Johanna. And some comedic timing. And improbability. <laughs> I'm trying to be humble. I'm trying Dan's, you know, Dan's comedy guy. We're complimenting each other, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> so because I was just trying to go because I, I go for the foreign part, so there's like uh, less competition, but with like that kind of American lead that what are the numbers? But you said that at least hundred about hundred people audition and probably many more people apply. And I guess we'd have to go back and look, but I think so. You know, part of it we 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 had to find someone so quickly. <laughs> so I don't think we, you know, we, we weren't looking for months, you know, it was more maybe a week or two weeks. Like it was, it was that fast as I recall. And so there was just, you know, not that much time for people to apply. And then, um, you know, so people submit and then, um, yeah, I remember, you know, I think, I think I did my pass and, and Evan obviously did, you know, was, you know, was looking for someone specific. And I think we, we both really, really liked her when we, when we saw her. So it was just the perfect fit. Well, we wanted, we wanted in addition to the comedic timing and, and the lovely disposition, Mississippi Al is a very strong character and we needed a very strong woman who could keep up with him. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank goodness we live in 2020 when there are a, a tremendous amount of strong women in the world. And we, we auditioned a, a tremendous amount. We had several callbacks, but I mean, Kendall is really just such a, a wonderful person and, and magnetic on the screen. And we knew that it was, it was a perfect compliment, uh, not, not as a, a character, but if you're looking at, at these people as a couple, we needed someone who would be a perfect couple with Mrs. Fial, and they really just blended together. Kendall, in real life even, 
was not afraid to, to call Brad out on some of the things which he thought was this or that. You know, they had their own, you know, dialogue separately, but they had to work together to build this couple and to build the relationship on screen. And we needed yeah. a strong woman and she is a strong woman. And we're, we're so thankful to have found her. Yeah, absolutely. There's that strength in, as, as Evan was talking about, there has to, there had to be chemistry between her and Al. And um, that was, you know, that, that was definitely present. But in order to really kind of buy that relationship, that needed to be there. Um, and so they complemented each other really well. Well, something, <clears throat> something else that um, I would like you to talk about is that so when you do a film with no money, now it has been released. It's um, it's fairly <laughs> possible to get it on all those platforms. Like now, it's on Amazon. People can can, can get their films on Amazon. But uh, how do you go about sharing it with the world? Mm. Tell me about the distribution and marketing. <clears throat> right. So I mean, what we spent a lot of time doing after uh, Final Cut was trying to find a distributor. And um, that was a lengthy process. It always is. Um, and so we had to find someone who, you know, we're a little bit of a niche moving in some ways. Um, and so trying to find the right distributor for this project was, you know, someone who really cared about it was very important. So we, we, we went to AFM and we got a couple offers and didn't really like any of the people there. And so we kept looking and I think, to, you know, we talked to some other people. Um, we, we talked to a lot of people and ultimately, um, you know, we found someone, I think, you know, Evan, you can tell the story exactly how it came about, but we found this, this really great distributor in New York and, um, you know, they, they believed in the picture and they're helping us get it out there. But, um, you know, that's just one part of it. So there's the distribution, which is being on the platforms, but then it's how do you get people to watch it? And that's what we're doing right now. And so, you know, if you talk about just the skill set required, you know, take, take a movie from the beginning all the way to, to where we are. Yeah, now we're in the marketing part. And so, you know, we haven't really brought on a marketing person. Um, and so we're doing it ourselves. And part of that is talking to people like you and, Part of that is understanding organic social media traffic and understanding SEM and, you know, building a website and um, understanding, you know, maybe blogs and trying to figure out cross promotion. So you have all of these different channels, you know, partnering with, with different organizations who, who believe in it in order to try to increase your reach and get people to know about it because it's, it's special and you just, you know, that people are going to like it when they see it. But they just need to know to watch it. And, and so, how, how is that going? Like, it's going well. We, um, we, we've, our, our, you know, we did a sort of a soft release on August 8th. So we've only been at this for less than a month now. So we're building all of this stuff right now. And I think it's going really well. We, we, have, um, we have press coming out of Maine. We have people in India who, who like it. We have other publications online who are you know talking about the movie and um, we're building an audience so we want to build up to the the tournament the north american life carrying tournament which is happening this year we're going to go out there and promote but we see this as you know this isn't a um, you know we're not treating this like the avengers where we're putting up you know hundreds of millions in p a in order to get the movie out there but what we're doing is we're building it um, organically from the bottom up and getting the word out that way. And um, so, I mean, our timeline is years. You know, we want people to see this. Obviously, we want it, you know, to hit. But, you know, we're, we're behind this thing. And, you know, over the next couple of months, we want that to be the first ramp up. And then we'll keep ramping up again. Um, and I don't know when that necessarily stops because I mean, as I guess we can't forget the sport takes place every year and it takes place all over the world. So there's, you know, opportunities in all of those events to, to get the word out as well. So it's just sort of thinking about in thinking creative ways. And um, I know it's, it's fun to do that. It's fun to, 
Evan's always coming to me with a new idea here, there, and they're, you know, really good ideas. And, you know, and then we try to check them and, you know, maybe I'll come up with here or there. And so it's, it's again, just a, it's a process. Well, I just want to thank uh, Steve Carl at our distribution company, Stonecutter, because th there are so many independent distributors who, you know, they, they sell a big stick and then you talk to them on the phone once and you, you send them a follow-up email with a question and they totally blow you off. Like, you know, who are you to be asking us any questions about the distribution process? But Steve was the exact opposite about that. You know, Dan and I spent four years on this project. Of course we have questions. <laughs> of course, it's, it's, our, it's our child. Yeah. Um, and, and Steve answered our phone calls every single time. He gets back to every single email inside of an hour. That's the type of relationship you want as first-time filmmakers, as independent filmmakers. You want a distributor who actually cares to get back to the, the producer and the directors of the projects that they're representing. Yeah. You know, beyond that, uh, Stonecutter did everything they promised us. They, they got us on all the platforms. And that, that's a, another miracle of this project. There's been several miracles. Finding Miska and Johanna and Kendall was a miracle. Uh, the wonderful partnership with Sunday River was a miracle. You know, working with these Finnish communities is a miracle. And finding Stonecutter is a miracle. Uh, and that's what it takes. You, you have to believe. Does it take time? Yes. Does it take years? Yes. Is it very painful? Yes. But if, if you find the right people, if you find the people who believe in your project, then the magic can happen. And uh, like I said at the beginning, I just want to thank Steve at Stonecutter. He got us on these platforms. Uh, Barbara at Artima Communications, thank you so much. She is our publicist uh, on the picture. She's doing great. Sto uh, Sunday River, there's, there's so many miracles. And, and you have to really just be happy for the blessings that come your way. And if you, if you have that kindness and you have that love for cinema in your heart, uh, you just be surprised by the wonders that can happen. Well, you talked about uh, cool things that there's uh, events coming up. You did the soft launch and what's coming up in October and yeah. all that. So, exactly. So we were released on most platforms on August 8th. And then there was, I think, you know, a couple others, which added a week later. And now what we're building to over the next, basically over the three months is to the North American wife carrying tournament in October. So it's happening. Uh, so I wonder if we should even be talking publicly about this. They're, they are going to announce something within the week and I'll just leave it at that. And so, um, you know, what that looks like, um, they will let us know, but that's kind of, that's how we're treating. Yeah, so you're hoping some kind of events where exactly. the film is going to yeah. be screened. Exactly. I guess I'm asking, what, what's the future for this film's uh, release? Everybody yeah. stay tuned to our social media. We're going to be keeping you updated. Wink, wink. There's stuff coming up in October. Wink, wink. Miska is going to be signing some posters. We're going to be doing some giveaways. Look at his pretty face. How do you not want a poster autographed by him? You know, th there's going to be a lot of stuff coming up, but please follow us on social media. Please stay tuned. As soon as we have information, we're going to update you. You know, we're working on the European release. We know Finland wants the movie. We know England and India want the movie. And we, we're working our hardest to get it to you. But thank you so much for watching this podcast. Thank you so much for supporting us. This is what we need. This is a, a small independent film made by a bunch of loving people who admire comedy, admire satire. We've been watching satire our whole lives, like Dr. Strange Love and, and other great films. Uh, you know, The Office, this is a mockumentary like The Office and Best in Show. It's a couple's movie. Uh, grab a, a six pack of beer and watch this movie. You won't regret it. Uh, you know, Miska's hysterical in it. Johanna's hysterical. Brad's hysterical. Kendall's hysterical. And you are hysterical. You actually have many scenes. 
Yeah, yeah. Wow, let's talk about that. I mean, let's talk about okay, absolutely. This energy, the passion, you know, just like the promotion, it's just built in. And, um, you know, that's, you know, I have to say, a lot of people love that character. Well, if you like watching people get smacked in the face, watch the movie. The real smacks. I didn't fake it. It's it's real stuff, <laughs> not fake news. And Dan is in the film too. I I do show up. You see, my the left side of my face. Personally, I think that's the best side of my face. So keep an eye out. In so, fact, I think it's a scene with you, Miska. Yeah? Yes, in the cafe. I noticed yeah. that. Yeah. So so I know that uh, the release is next up. All this stuff is up for you next. But and do you have any other project? What are you guys working on? What's next for you apart from this? Well, wait a minute. I got a question for you, Miss Guy. You're yes. jumping the gun here. What was it like running in the in the real North American wife carrying tournament? You grew up, you know, a mile away from the Finnish World's Wife Carrying Tournament, who's promoting us. What was it like? You're representing the sport. You're representing your country. Yeah, I grew up about 20 miles away from the actual competition in Finland. It was rough. It was actually really hard because uh, in America, the track is uh, on a hill. So you actually need to go uphill and then you go down. Well, I haven't run the Finnish track either, but I know that it's more even. So even though the actual running takes um, uh, about one minute to two and a half minutes, it depends who is running. It's actually really, really hard. So that was uh, that was tough. Uh, and we only had, I think we had two weeks to rehearse. What? What was the mud pit like? Well, the mud pit is tricky because I, I watched the movie and it looks like that we are going really slow in that, which we are. But the main thing in the mud pit is that it's better to be safe and not drop the lady because I think you get extra time from for that, right? So it's better to be safe and slow instead of being trying to be as fast as you can and drop her. But it just looks very slow when we're on the mud pit. <laughs> that, that's the main thing, to be safe. Very cool. Dan, what do you feel about, you know, the whole we're at the real tournament? I mean, you were there, you, you flew to Maine. I haven't heard much about you about the whole running the real tournament. It's the real event. I mean, this is the stuff that really makes the movie pop is that it, it's real. We're not like in a, a sound stage. How do you produce that? How do you get insurance for that? And how do you oh, put boy. it together? Yeah. Um, you know, there was, there was, definitely an energy you know being there there's there's something exciting about being at the real thing none of it's staged um and you know you, you're there working with the tournament to make this to pull this off um so maybe the stakes are a little bit higher as you said there's only minutes that you have to get the right shots if you don't get the right shots the movie probably doesn't work were you nervous? Were you nervous about if you don't get it, the movie's going to fail? You're a producer. You raise, you know. So, yeah. The, the, um, when, it, when it comes, my concerns, it, as sort of they have to be, are, you know, got to make sure no one gets injured, have to make sure everyone stays safe, have to make sure that all the shots are, you know, getting got, <laughs> if that even makes sense. So all of these things, just just making sure it all happens. And, um, you know, I think so much of it was pre-planning. We had to think about this in advance. We had to plan it down to a T. We needed to know minute by minute what we were doing. And so that goes back to Miska's scheduling question. So I think that was, that was a really, you know, big element. And then, you know, things like insurance, um, you know, they can be tough to insure for. So you have to talk to the insurer. You have to explain what you're doing. You know, maybe the insurer is even laughing in some ways. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute, Miska, just to fill you in. So a, a big drama in pre-production was how do we get insurance for actors who are running in a real tournament going in a, a four feet deep mud pit in a, a foreign state? Uh, how, how do you do that? Because we want to make sure that there's, there's workers' compensation. We want to make sure that if if anybody pulls an ankle, of course, you know, that the, it, it, yeah. we followed SAG protocols and everything. 
Yeah, I mean, that's, I think that's what it is. It's, it's all protocols and it's all just making sure you're doing things by the book. So that was the most important thing. And I mean, there are always, the, you know, these challenges, um, but we found a way to, to overcome them. You know, you find the, the right insurer, you know, whatever, whatever it is. And um, well, so, yeah, why, why do we need production insurance? I, I don't even, I don't know if all the audience knows why you have to have it to make a movie and to, to get E and O insurance. You know, what are all these crazy elements that you have to do to, to release a picture? Well, I don't know. So let me ask you that. Miska, am I going to be boring people by talking about this? No, this is great. Okay. This is great. Well, I mean, okay. So some of the things like what are, what are involved, there's, I mean, I guess if you're starting at the very beginning, there's, um, you know, there's the operating agreement. So, you, you know, we decided to form an LLC. You have to, you know, we formed an operating agreement as amongst um, everyone on, you know, who is, who is, basically a producer and then from there you um, have to discuss investors put together investor agreements and then you put together all of the you know, the contracts and the paperwork for um, for cast and crew and then there's the budgeting and then there's the scheduling and as you're doing that you're thinking about tax implications and um, as you get around to budgeting, you are budgeting for things like insurance, which you wouldn't think you need, but things happen. And if yeah, things, why do you need that? Well, you know, it's um, well, there's there's the workers' compensation angle, which is something that just you know comes with um, you know anyone who's really kind of working working a job. There's there's that element, um, and then there's there's different types of insurance within this larger production insurance category. And so you just need to figure out what you need to be covered for. So maybe it's something like general. And so you might want, you know, a million dollars coverage here um, just to protect yourself. I mean, I, the way I think about insurance is it's, you're not protecting yourself for likely outcomes. You're protecting yourself against the worst. And so as long as you're protecting yourself against the worst, then you can sleep better at night. And the entire point of producing is to be able to sleep. So that's, that's how I sort of think about it. And, um, you know, and then there's the next element. So then you have to get all the equipment. You have to figure out how do you rent it for the you know, effective prices? How do you manage logistics, get everything from LA to Maine? How do you, you know, book flights for cast and crew? Um, and then once people are there, you have to make sure that they're eating every X number of hours. You have to make sure they're not, you know, going over or else you're paying overtime and people are unhappy and it's unsafe, ensuring safe working conditions, working with the tournament, keeping people happy, being on your toes because never things never go as planned. They always go not according to plan. So being prepared for the unexpected, you know, and then once you figure that out, um, you know, we made a movie that had, I mean, <sighs> this was, I mean, this was tough, but we had to talk about clearances. So there's copyright issues and trademarks and, you know, the clearance and copyright issue about, well, what happens if there's, I don't know, a logo or a trademark, you know, in, the, in this scene, if there's material in the background, how do you handle that? So those are releases. So making sure you're getting background releases and releases for everyone who's in the movie. Um, and then talking to, then you have to talk to lawyers and, you know, you talk to the lawyers and, um, figure out what the risks are and get something called errors and in omission insurance. And that's, um, what's that? So it, it, E and O or errors and omission is to protect yourself. There's, there's a couple of, of things, but making a movie, there's something called chain of title. So basically from script stage all the way to final product, the rights sort of change along the way. And so you have to be on top of all of that and have to ensure that there's chain of title. If something, you know, if you went through the copyright process, but maybe forgot something, you know, that, that might be covered. Um, you know, well, I was really maybe, I don't know if it was concerned, but something that we really needed professional help about was just, um, making sure that we weren't violating any, any laws when it came to intellectual property. And so, um, e you know, insurance helps with things like that. And oftentimes a distributor will need to see it in order for your film to get distribution. 
So that's that. And then you get to distribution. Now you're talking about marketing. And so you have to understand how to build a website. You have to understand if you're doing all this stuff yourself. You know, you're probably hiring people, but a general idea about all of it. So, I mean, it's, um, it's quite the process. <laughs> I mean, that's, I guess, in a nutshell, what this project kind of looked like. And there's, there's still more to it than that. Um, so that's the beauty of, of Couples of Wife Caring. Uh, the three people you're seeing here today are three of the people who really made this picture happen. Mm -hmm. we, we met Miska, you know, three years ago. And to this day, he's, he's supporting the movie. He's promoting the movie. And, you know, part of me is like, I, I don't know why. And then the other part of me is like, I'm just so happy to see this handsome guy's face every time we talk on video chat. Yes, <laughs> two years ago, right? No, no, it's it's been three years now. In October, it will no, because we we auditioned you in July of 2017. Oh, yeah. oh, it was three years ago. Yeah, okay. So, Miska, here's my question for you, because you have a, a horror movie that you've been working on. How long does it take to make a movie? How long is, is the process really for filmmakers? Well, for me, it was four to, I think it was five years or four. And what I think role was, did you have on the horror film? I was the filmmaker, so I wrote it, directed, and I definitely did a big part of uh, editing and... Producing? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, like, uh, I had the responsibility in all of those, but I definitely got help from other people. We yeah. had a real producer, That's but so I, I was overseeing the whole process. It's a lot of hats. Yes, I, I think that's the way filmmakers need to do if you don't have any money. But I had a couple of really, really good uh, producers and people who helped. But essentially, it comes to you if you can't hire people with real money. So would you say the process, at least for a, an independent filmmaker, is uh, do it yourself? Y yeah, definitely. It's like you shouldn't wait. Like, uh, think about what you have. You even you can even do it with your iPhone. You usually have an apartment. You have some friends or you at least know some people. So just go out or shoot it in your apartment instead of waiting for half a year or years to get some funding. So use whatever resources you have. Totally. I know, 100%. And I think, you know, if you can tell a good story in a single location with nothing, you, you know, you can practice that way and you can only imagine what you'd be able to do with a bigger budget. Yes. So I think you, so, there's a lot you can learn with that. Yes. And you, you can just do your first film and then you can get some more money and do the second film, but don't, don't wait, just use whatever you have. Yeah. The cavalry is not coming. Have you heard about that? Ooh, that's a, that's a good saying. It's a Mark Duplass speech from a film festival. He's talking about the cavalry is not coming. Oh, is this, I, you know, I'm not sure if this is the same speech, but I remember Duplass talking. It's a about, famous speech. Just like anteing up. Is that kind of like you do it for one and the next one, maybe you get a name and then the next one, higher budget. Is that? Yeah, that's exactly that. There, there's never really going to be anyone coming and offering you heaps of money. So mm -hmm. just use whatever you have and build from that. That's great. That's really inspiring speech. Yeah, well, actually. Well, wait, again, going back to Spike Lee. So I went to the, the University of Arizona is my alma mater. And um, I did a filmmaking degree. And one year, Spike Lee came to campus. And he was talking about how, uh, I believe he won a Student Academy Award or he was nominated for a Student Academy Award for a short film. And he said, oh, my God, like, of course, the studios are going to call me. And he waited for almost a year. This is what he was saying at, the, at this live event. He waited almost for a year for the phone to ring and no one caught him, no agency, no studio. And he said he has to do it himself. And after he, he came to that conclusion, he went out and raised the money for, I, I believe the title of the picture was She's Gotta Have It. And with $70,000 over the course of the year, he made this movie himself and this is back when you had to use real film not uh, a digital card so it's it's much harder to process the film to edit the film with no money and uh, i mean 
that's him, Spike Lee, and, and Robert Rodriguez is really uh, the backbone or the foundation for the inspiration to make Couples of Wife Gang for no budget whatsoever. Zero, zero budget. <laughs> Believe in yourself as filmmakers. You don't have to have money. You, you really don't. You need, you need a camera. You need people who believe in the project, a great script. If it's a comedy, find great comedic, comedic actors. If it's a drama, find great dramatic actors. There's so many artists in the world today that are more than eager to, to join a project like Couples of Wife Caring, like your project that you have at home. Right now, as you're watching this podcast, whether you're in Finland, the United States, New Zealand, somewhere in, in any continent around the world, don't wait, as, as Miska was saying, do not wait for people to call you. Don't wait for, you know, Steve Bezos to give you $10 billion at Amazon. Go out, you know, find friends to give you $500. We had some investors on Couples of White Caring who only gave $500. And that $500, Dan and I stretched. We got an airplane for 50 bucks. We got a bus for 50 bucks. We got the wife carrying tournament for free. Uh, you know, we did have to fly the actors to the tournament, but if you really shop around properly, you can find cheap air flights from Los Angeles to Maine. It's not like you're spending $10,000 on tickets. I, I think we sat in, in uh, zone 10 or zone 11 just to get to Maine because that was what we could afford. And we had one sound guy and two camera guys, uh, an associate producer, Dan and myself. And, and really that was the crew on set. Uh, and Marisol. Who helped here and there. Yes, Marisol. We had people who helped in Maine with different logistics and you can see them in our credits. Uh, and we thank them dearly for, for helping us in the different positions uh, pro bono but you don't need a lot of money. All you need is, is the belief in yourself, the belief in your story, and, and the belief in filmmaking and, and cinema. I mean, it, it's, it's a magical experience that com, uh, combines all the art forms, visual arts, musical arts, uh, writing, everything is combined into this, this really wonderful form of storytelling. And you, you don't need a million dollars. You can do it for under 10 grand if you really wanted to. It, it, no joke, uh, it, it can be done. But find a good editor. If you don't have a good editor, you're in trouble. So what, what's next for you guys apart from this film? You know, we've, we've, we've talked about it a little bit, but I mean, I think we've been so focused. I'm maybe I'll speak more for, for myself, but I've been, you know, been so focused on this project and just doing it justice um, that we just, I mean, I know I just want to see this to the end and um, what comes next. I don't really know, honestly. Um, and I'm okay with that, you know, for now. Uh, so I think, you know, this, this part is still just beginning, you know, we're just, you know, getting the word out of about the picture. It's, it's, it's not nowhere near, um, done and we want to go international. So let's let's get it to the audience. Let's get the world looking at it. And then you know once that's done, you know, let's figure out maybe what's next. I agree with Dan. Right now we're focused on couples of wife caring. I'm always writing scripts. I have several scripts, but what I can say absolutely is that uh, if another project does come along, uh, Miska uh, would definitely be cast in the picture. Oh, yeah. Wow, thank you. I can speak different accents. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. You're going to be Chris Hemsworth. Let's hear some accents. Can you uh, ask us a question in your German accent? Well, uh, is, uh, ich liebe dich. <laughs> uh, 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 actually, hold on. Is, I, I am from Berlin. Nice to meet you. I am from Germany and uh, I believe in very important courses. And uh, there is very good uh, German things that are in here. Wow. It, 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 ein Oberstum Buche is my friend. That is the, we go to the Mauer together and we like to do that. And we are under the Linden speaking and drinking wine. And that is very good for us. Terrific. Amazing. 
I can only count to ten in German. And, and often, but I often also need to speak Russian accent because I am dark. I, I don't look Finnish. Uh, Finnish people are uh, blonde, but I'm from Russia. I'm from Moscow. So I usually <laughs> look like this, like a Russian villain. We like vodka and uh, other stuff. St. Petersburg is my hometown. Have you seen the Americans? No, no, but I should. There's lots uh, of Russians there. It's just a good show. Period. I will check it out. I will definitely check it out. Well, listen, yeah. Metzka, it was great chatting with you tonight. It's great chatting with Dan. I got to walk my dog before we go to bed. <laughs> she has to, you know, go potty. Um, I'm really happy to have been here with you tonight. Thank you so much for being a part of the picture. I, I greatly look forward to doing more podcasts with you. And for everybody watching this, please uh, watch Couples of Wife Caring. It's a wonderful movie. Grab your man, grab your lady, or, you know, grab some beer too. You know, it's great while you're drinking and enjoy the movie. It, it's a, it's a romp and uh, I promise you enjoy it. And it's available in America, uh, in US and Canada. Just put it on Google and you can rent it right away. And it's coming all the other countries in the future and coming to Finland at some point too. Absolutely. And the handle for social media is at, at couples of wife carrying movie. So follow us on social, Facebook, Instagram, and we're doing a little revamp to our website. So you'll see that too. Well, but you we can rent us on Amazon Prime Video Direct, iTunes, Google Play, YouTube, Fandango, Vudu, uh, Vimeo, and then on all cable providers. But make sure Most if you're them. searching for us on the cable providers in North America that you do the voice search option because there's a lot of movies coming out right now, and, and they're is. all good, but our movie is better than their movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you heard it here first. Oh. And I think this was so fun that we are going to have a second one like this with some of the cast. What do oh, you please. think? Yeah, we want to bring everyone. Well, not everyone, but yeah, it'd be great to have, you know, Joanna here and Kendall and, and Stephanie. And yeah. So let's do that in a few weeks. Did, did we cover everything? Anything else in your mind? Tonight is the men of wife caring. The next podcast will be the women of wife caring. And without them, it, it would not have been possible. Like I said, 10 times before, this movie is a collaboration between everybody. I want to be on the next one too, though. Uh, you're gonna have to get a wig, Dan. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> All right. No, I, Musk, I think we I think we covered covered a lot, and I mean I, I feel like we could talk for hours, and I'd love to. Maybe we uh, maybe we save some of that for next time. Yes, dogs need to pee too. I've got to, I have to feed uh, my little kitty too. So did Evan leave? <laughs> Evan already left. No. Okay. Well, thank you, Daniel. This was great. Thank you, Miska. Thank so you, Evan. Fun. See you soon. Bye. Thank you, everyone, for listening and watching. Bye. We'll be back soon. Thank you for listening to this episode of With Miska Podcast. And this podcast can be found on, well, you can, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, put it on Google, or my home webpage, www.miskakayanus.com. And thank you for listening and have a nice day or night or have, have a nice something.